Yes. Welcome everybody to the uh, Zoom meeting this evening. Uh, could I invite everybody to turn off their mutes or turn on their mutes so that we don't hear the background chat during my introduction or Richard's talk. The position is that uh, Jonathan and I have considered how questions could be formulated after Richard's talk and we think the best option is for people to access through their chat button the uh, chat contact page and to put in writing to type out the question that they would like to be put to Richard and either Jonathan or I at the end of the talk will deal with it in that way. So can I begin by introducing Richard Griffiths? He is a, a highly distinguished and respected architect specializing in heritage buildings. His firm bears his name and as one of those involved in the fundraising campaign for the restoration and cleaning of the east front of St Alphage, uh, I know from per personal experience what was involved in the restoration of a grade one listed building. Uh, and the care which went into the cleaning of the carvings. Whether those in attendance tonight are, are churchgoers or whether we merely live in or visit Greenwich, everybody, I am absolutely certain, has been impressed by what has been achieved in the restoration of our great church uh, of St Alphage, one of Hawksmoor's greatest buildings. It's no surprise that the work at St Alphage was in fact shortlisted by the Georgian group for one of its national awards. Richard is going to speak not only about the St Alphage restoration, but also about the restoration of Southwark Cathedral. He was the cathedral architect from 1997 to 2012, and he supervised the Millennium Project, which involved the cleaning and floodlighting of the external fabric, the landscaping of the churchyard, and the design of new buildings around the new churchyard. That work was awarded an RIBA National Award and I urge you, if you haven't been to Southwark Cathedral, to visit the building to see not only what has been done in terms of a wonderful and sympathetic restoration, but how the new buildings have been integrated into the context of the cathedral. I think it's extraordinary and beautiful. I wanted very briefly to touch on three other projects with which Richard has been involved. The College of Arms, which uh, I anticipate many of us are familiar with in Queen Victoria Street, just on the north bank of the Thames, near to the Millennium Bridge, is again a magnificent grade one listed building. If you visit it now, after it's been restored, you'll see how magnificent it looks. The restoration involved uh, brickwork with uh, the special lime-based mortar being attached. All the window surrounds and joinery have been refurbished. And the end result it is magnificent. The second project is Knightsbridge. I, I said to Richard as we were leading up to the off tonight that with a large number of the members of the Greenwich Society being regular pilgrims to Harrods, you only need to look up uh, as you go down Knightsbridge to see what has happened in relation to that extraordinary uh, set of buildings, 13 buildings in fact, all designed and built in Edwardian times in red brick with wonderful Portland stone 
dressings uh, and uh, ornamentation. And if you look at that building again, now it's been restored, you see what a, a sensitive restoration can achieve. And the third project, showing in the way the diversity of the work which uh, Richard's firm and Richard in particular does, is the refurbishment of the Gothic Hall at Oriel College, Oxford. The hall was built in the 1630s and the restoration work involved, among other things, the redecoration of the whole of the frieze which runs along above the wooden panelling. It's now been redecorated and even in daytime, I think it would look lovely. In the evening, with the new lighting within the dining hall at Oriel, the gilding of the frieze reflects those highlights and creates an extraordinary experience. Of course, Oriel is the college where in the first courtyard, there's the statue of Cecil Rhodes, but as far as I could establish, uh, Richard, from my research, you weren't involved either in the restoration of Cecil Rhodes' statue or the removal of it and throwing of it into the ISIS, which may be what some of the undergraduate members of the college might have suggested uh, was the proper destination for one of their great benefactors. Anyway, enough of me. Nobody's come tonight to hear me talk. They've come to hear you talk, and we're honoured and delighted, Richard, that you're prepared to talk about the restoration of St Alfred's and Southwark Cathedral, and indeed anything else that you seek to enlighten us about. Thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Tim, for your kind words. Um, um, just as an aside, um, although I didn't have anything to do with the sculpture of uh, roads at uh, Oriel, I did. <laughs> I was architect for Jesus College, uh, Cambridge, where I put the famous Occocor, the uh, Benin bronze cockerel, in pride of place in the middle of the screen. And uh, that has now been removed and given back, um, uh, rather sadly, from the aesthetic point of view, if not the um, moral point of view. But uh, anyway, that's another story. Um, it's very, uh, actually, um, nice for me to uh, be able to talk to the Greenwich Society this evening um, and I've chosen, um, well the reason particularly is that um, yes my, my involvement with Nalfej in fact uh, is 25 years uh, as architect of the church amazingly um, but considerably longer than that as musician in the church I used to play bassoon with Philip Sims so um, it's very uh, close to my heart um, and it illustrates um, rather well um, what I have found so rewarding as an architect in working with um, uh, old buildings rather than um, just new buildings um, in a way that other architects think is what architecture is. Um, I think uh, working with existing, particularly old and historic buildings uh, has all the challenges of dealing with new buildings and a whole lot more about dealing with the texture of age, memory, um, layers of history as opposed to a single layer, all those things which make them so fascinating. And St. Alphage is uh, fantastic from that point of view, and so is Southwark at the other end of the, uh, the railway. So uh, I'm now going to share my screen. So that's the, the first screen. As you see, I've called it welcoming visitors. Now, that's uh, significant because um, um, I think that the work that I do is two, two main things. One is revealing what's already so wonderful that's there, which has been uh, rather hidden for various reasons. And the second is adding a new layer, as I would call it, to um, um, make the buildings address the present and the future. And in the context of churches, it's been a particularly um, uh, fascinating period um, in the last uh, 20 years, largely, I think, because of the availability of uh, lottery funding. Um, 
in order to get the lottery funding, you have to have a, 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 a vision, which is not just um, um, repairing and dealing with uh, what you might call the physical side, but it's also dealing with um, opening these buildings to a wider public. Uh, this isn't, I hope, to say that this is at the expense of the church as a church and welcoming building. Um, and I think I can show that at Southwark, and I hope in future at, at St. Alphage, that um, it means that the church is filling a wider role as well as um, a, a visitor role. So um, moving on. So Nelfage, now with all our projects, we need to start off by understanding what it is we're dealing with and indeed to unpick the different layers, as I call it. Um, at St. Alphage, we have the first independent example of a church by Nicholas Hawksmoor, who's one of the, I would say, geniuses of English architecture. And he had had a whole career up to that working with Wren, Bamborough and people, and this was his first opportunity in 1712 to design a church himself. And at that stage, he was deeply fascinated by um, uh, ancient history and the primitive origins of uh, architecture. And he very much had in mind this as being um, a temple. And you can look at the sides and see the march of the columns you can see the uh, rather late antique um, arch in the middle, like you get in um, Palmyra or Baalbek uh, or, or, or on the East End. And this very strong modeling and this rather austere, um, where it isn't um, as Baroque as it was in some of the other churches. So here we have a Doric order um, with, can you see my pointer, by the way, if I point? Yeah. Yeah, um, so this is Doric Order with the triglyphs and metopes and this extraordinarily large, deep, overhanging uh, hanging corners. So the investigation of the drawings which survive from Hawksmoor are, I find, deeply fascinating particularly this one, where you can see at the bottom, and it's obviously drawn first because it's at the bottom of the page, um, a, a classical portico. And then the next one up, you put a broken pediment on top of it, and you fill in the walls on either side, and you have the recess for three bays in the middle, and that's pretty much what was built. And then above that, it looks as though he tried another variant in it, where the middle bit breaks forward, and the, um, uh, the, the, the entablature at this point um, does not have the full decorative detail, but um, he obviously um, abandoned that one. Um, and yet there are a whole series of uh, studies for, um, for the church, which are referred to in the minutes, and this is, particularly tantalizing because uh, there were four, no less than four wooden models of the uh, different versions of the church, um, which um, moved around the place and they, um, at the point that they were in a, a museum, um, they were labeled. So this is Roman Doric four. So we've lost one, two and three. No, we still got the ground plans. And as you can see, this is a very much longer church. And the position where the tower is, and the tower becomes terribly important, is um, actually inside a very long church. But they didn't have the money for that. So it was, it was cut back. And this is a drawing that we found during the, um, uh, the present project by Hawksmoor in the uh, Greenwich archives, but unrecognized. And here, this is, this is pretty much um, has built, although the um, uh, the steps are different, and um, but if I you look at the other end, you'll see it's absolutely symmetrical. It's a, a, a pediment at each end, just like a temple. So where's the tower? Well, Hawksmoor wanted to uh, demolish the tower, um, at least 
it was going to be perhaps inside the church in the first team um, and then he moved it outside but he wasn't allowed to uh, to move it um, to a, a new position altogether and so this was his design first and you can see that what he was going to do was um, uh, clad the tower and then have a, a top knot which is in fact what was built not here but at uh, St George in the East so uh, you, you nearly had a bit of St George in the East on your church um, and this is a, a map uh, plan of 1728 for the Royal Hospital and you can see how carefully the new road was laid out in order to uh, be on access to the, the uh, pre-existing portico of the church. Um, and just coming back to Hawke's Law in the way he designed, as I say, he was interested in a primitive um, uh, origins of architecture. And my understanding is that the bottom bit of the tower is by Hawke's Law. And this is John James later on, uh, higher up in a more uh, cuddly fashion. But look how stark um, Hawksmoor is. Um, it's, it's pilasters reduced to their absolute minimum. It's just a, 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 a sinking between two flat planes. And um, I also refer you to his West Towers at Westminster Abbey from somewhat later, because I think you can see the same the same sort of articulation of this uh, it's just got a couple of uh, gothic ribs on it but uh, basically you can see the pier here and the pier here are um, in the same family and it's that aspect of primitivism here's the top of the, um, the columns and then this is the vestigial uh, entablature architrave frieze and cornice um, it's about as elemental as you can get as elemental as John Soane at um, the Dulwich Picture Gallery, uh, where you get the same thing, that the uh, pilasters are simply brick. Um, so the next layer is, of course, the, the fire um, uh, being firebombed in the war and rebuilt by Albert Richardson. And for those of you who haven't been inside the roof, um, these are two uh, photographs, um, one of the main roof, nave roof space, and this is the funny apse, which is actually over the organ chamber at the east end, so you don't really see it at all. And you can see how it's all made of um, metal trusses and bars and ribs carrying um, fibrous plaster. Um, really rather uh, an extraordinary space in its own right. Um, so, if we go back to the beginning, uh, I've just been appointed architect in, uh, at the church in 1996, um, uh, I think it was, so 25 years ago, um, and I did bits of work um, for years and years and years and years until the uh, moment at which the, um, the fundraising campaign starts to restore the church to its full, full glory. And uh, this is just a reminder of just how grimy the church was before we started. Now, I personally find that the effect of soot on uh, Portland stone can be really rather fantastic. And, um, when I was a child, I think most churches have got a thick incrustation. Um, in this case, I'm pretty clear that this was cleaned once before. And what you're seeing is a bloom of sort of tarry deposits coming back through the stone. It would have been, you know, three inches thick of crust. And so, um, although there is some romance about uh, sooty surfaces, I don't think this comes too much in that category. Um, Physically speaking, the main problem was that despite the stunning quality of the Portland Stone and the construction, um, they used, Hawksmoor used iron cramps between the um, stones to hold uh, adjacent stones together. And iron expands, wrought iron expands um, to 10 times its original volume. And it's a force you aren't stop 
all you can try and do is either take it out or stop the water getting at it in the first place. So this is the sort of damage that it could do that we had to cope with. And this is an example uh, of, this is the architrave, freeze and cornice. And you can see the iron cramp here, which had just been removed to get at it. It's been necessary to uh, go right back through the broken stone and there'll be a massive piece of stone going back in again to deal with that. Um, uh, not in too many cases, um, but uh, enough to be uh, a pretty major uh, uh, exercise. So the first um, campaign was the uh, tower and the west elevation. Um, the second campaign of cleaning was the, um, the east elevation facing the high street. And these are the drums, which are rather like Roman altars in um, uh, Hawksmoor's um, uh, way of thinking. And um, we got a lot of stick because, well, let me point out first that this bit of iron here has lifted the whole of that drum by that amount. So we had to lift the whole drum off, take off the iron, put it back again, and then do conservation work. Uh, we were heavily, heavily criticized by um, someone in Greenwich because they thought that we'd um, destroyed some of the sculptural um, detail in doing that. But I can assure you that um, the appearance is because someone put on a cementy slurry at some stage before us. And so um, there's not much we could do about that. Um, while we were working on the tower, um, there was a question of what to do with this um, monument, which looked so sad and terrible. Um, so you can just about see uh, in the after photograph that uh, there are bits of replacement like that lid. Um, there are, um, I think the whole side of cheek of that is new. Um, and then the stone from that point upwards has been lost. So there's a new bit of stone here. And then we've removed the, um, the lime to reveal the stone, uh, dark stone color beneath. So the only thing that's missing is some sort of sculptural feature, uh, which um, you can just see the ghosts of. Um, but architecturally speaking, we hope that that brings it all together. So then we move on to the, um, the uh, heart of Greenwich project. Um, the initiative from uh, people in the church, particularly Chris Moody and Jill, um, to make a, 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 a bid to the uh, lottery fund in order to um, restore the church because the two elevations were still dirty. The roof was leaking very, very badly on the two what we might call transepts. And um, we had a whole interesting series of discussions with the group about how to frame a project which wasn't just, um, uh, as it were, dealing with a whole lot of issues in isolation, but tried to have an overall rationale about uh, transformation. And the, uh, the, um, the name Heart of Greenwich was um, really indicative of a decision that the making this wonderful church uh, known and uh, welcomed to the vast numbers of visitors to, to Greenwich and the Naval Hospital. Um, and that meant, I think we all um, unanimously came to the conclusion that it had to be a question that for visitors at least, the entrance needed to be from the north. And this drawing which we did was supposed to um, capture the essence of having the, um, the overthrow here, which was languishing in the crypt of the church. Um, it uh, was originally on the East End um, and it's by uh, Albert Richardson as part of his work. And that's centered on the North door into the church. And then um, the ramp, which is another story, which I can come, I'll come back to. Um, and then cleaning, floodlighting, and um, curing the leaks on the roof, and 
making extra loons uh, in order to serve the church. And then finally, uh, internal redecoration, having dealt, we hope, with the water problem. So here is the entrance as it is now. And the great thing about a project which was as, in a sense, as comprehensive as it could be uh, with the funding uh, from these wider sources was that um, a whole lot of issues to do with the paving and so on could all be dealt with as well. Um, so first on the, the technical point, um, I'm not sure if I've got a, no. Um, <clears throat> but you see here, this is, um, is actually an overflow because the, the whole of the roofs um, drain to the ground via internal rainwater pipes. And the, the worst offender was one which was in the north transept in the corner where um, that had got blocked. Um, water had got nowhere to go apart from cascading down inside the building. And um, the rule of thumb is that when water gets into masonry and soaks it, it takes an inch, uh, a month per inch to dry out. So if your wall is um, uh, 20 inches thick, then that's going to be 20 months. Um, so it's serious stuff. So this is an overflow drilled straight through in order that if it does start backing up, then um, it won't damage the inside of the church. Um, <clears throat> Now, this is a drawing which dates from my interview as church architect in uh, 1996. Um, and it was a proposal about uh, solving the problem, which seemed to be impossible to solve satisfactorily any way other than that, if you were not going to mess up Hawksmoor. Um, was to have a, a freestanding ramp in metal and, and, and timber, and at that stage it was on the north. So it was rather funny to find that after we'd done lots of options appraisals and feasibility studies, we finish up with one on the south, which is in the same sort of principle. And um, the there are a whole lot of rules about the um, gradients and landings. Uh, on here, but because the, the path is running uphill, at this point you run back, and it's all at um, um, the, uh, the the one in twenty um, magic uh, gradient. Um, but there has to be a landing halfway along, and I was very determined that we were going to get a nice smooth line from handrail. So um, the handrail isn't actually parallel to the. Um, um, to the walkway. Um, it's quite a major bit of engineering, as you can see. Um, and it's just as well we went along and had a visit at this stage because they were about to put the handles, handrail uh, parallel to the, um, uh, the ramp rather than following its own separate line and uh, going in and then um, as it is um, uh, now. <clears throat> Um, and the paving repaved. But the thing you may not have noticed is that the, this ramp simply finishes at um, the top step. There were then two more steps leading into the church. So in this case, we took up the stones and laid them to uh, a fall, which just gets underneath that level. So it's um, uh, extremely complicated. Um, inside, of course, um, the project was only really for uh, the redecoration, um, but I hope that that's um, uh, done justice to the, to the architecture. Um, and there was one other little thing though, which was that these rather extraordinary um, light fittings designed by Albert Richardson, uh, a sort of rather Egyptian lotus leaf-like, um, were had been 
chipped around the edges, probably by people putting up scaffolding to do the decoration. So we had the opportunity to mend all of those chips, which was something which I found uh, very satisfactory. Um, and then the, 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 the loo question, I mean, um, this was, again, subject to so much discussion you wouldn't believe, but um, uh, having looked at every which way possible, then the one that English Heritage favoured most was putting a freestanding sort of pod in um, the staircase wells. Of course, there are four identical staircase wells, so you've still got two at the um, <coughs> south, which are untouched, um, and they're dealt dealt with as um, uh, oak oak um, uh, pods, really, and so the loo is hanging on a panel, which is in the position of a door, which is underneath the staircase. So, um, uh, <clears throat> then we have, um, I think, um, well, uh, really just another uh, another view of the the church um, and I don't think that it's ever looked better than it has since Albert Richardson finished um, um, certainly a few years ago there was an exercise for cleaning the floor which did quite a lot so I hope that um, that is uh, uh, an improvement um, so so, so finally, just to show the, um, the church in its uh, finished state uh, with the floodlighting, which is set into the ground, um, which um, I'm sure some people feel, uh, I know some people are uh, worried about floodlighting and think that it's necessary. Um, in, this, in this case, I think um, because of its centrality in in, in Greenwich, it's um, uh, it does place it where it ought to be at the heart of Greenwich. There's one other aspect of the project, which was the Crypt project, which I think the tours are about to start um, fairly soon. I hope, <clears throat> but this is rather an extraordinary. Um, it's called a point cloud uh, survey um, of the church by taking a laser, which sends out billions of uh, little spots. And because they're spots, you can actually sort of see through them and you can edit them. And in this case, they've spliced together a whole lot of different ones so that you can see the crypt corridors going down underneath. Uh, I think uh, um, that's really rather splendid. That was done uh, with the aid of the University of Greenwich. Um, and then to make it accessible, um, obviously there's no way that we could make uh, compliance um, uh, uh, wheelchair friendly access. Um, so what we have done is uh, make the steps regular. These two bits of a hinge up and they fill in the gap. So when the door's shut, it's obviously tripping down and the handrails uh, then uh, give you support as you're going down into the crypt. Um, and the crypt, <clears throat> as it is now, following the, um, uh, the, 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 the clearing out uh, of some of the debris, the opening up of bits which have been closed off, and uh, the, um, uh, some repair and pointing of brickwork, and tidying up all of the electric so they sit in a tray. Um, <clears throat> beneath the apex of the, uh, the vault. And then the churchyard, the state that it was in, if you recall, um, lots of loose cobbles here, lots of um, up and down paving here, a missing patch here, the raised bed here where there had been a tree or two trees which were taken down a few years ago. And inconsequential little bit of grass uh, in um, this position. So the plan of the churchyard was very much about <clears throat> <coughs> editing the paving so that within this line it's all paved 
and then outside that line it's it's all greenery and so there's paving where the tree was and this has all been relayed and these pavings have been relayed to give a clear progression and um i uh would also draw your attention to the um the bit of paving here because previously you could go out of the church uh, and to get to the uh, church hall you had to go down to um bits of pavement so we've raised the levels of the path and ramped down the um uh, the cobbles like this so here's the new path and here are the cobbles going up and down again So that is just my uh, final slide on St. Alphege with the um, contrast between uh, before as it was and now as it is. So I'm now going to um, move on to Southern Cathedral and the situation there was um, exactly the other way around from St. Alphage, because St. Alphage, the, um, the, the heart of Greenwich project, um, came as a, uh, the culmination of um, many years of being involved with the church. Whereas at Southwark, the new um, Millennium project uh, came in the third month of my being appointed. Um, a, uh, a project for new development to the south of the uh, sorry north of the cathedral uh, had been initiated and it was announced that it had been long listed in the final round and so um i remember distinctly um going around to meet the dean colin slee and him saying um we've just been long listed um how do you think we should move forward? And I had to say, well, I'm afraid that if you go forward with the present plans, you will never get anywhere because they've been heavily criticized by English heritage and the planners and so on. Um, and he said, well, so uh, who, 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 who do you think should do it? And I said, I'd love to have a go. And he said, OK, and that was it. I was um, suddenly um, architect for a six million pound scheme. Um, <clears throat> so. I thought I would just talk about the wider aspects of Southwark, where I was um, architect for 16 years before homing in on the Millennium Project. Um, one of the pleasures of being in a that position um is getting to the bits of the building that other people don't get to so this is the view down into the chancel from the uh, way up to the tower i mean it's very thrilling the sort of uh, getting into the interstices of these great buildings um the second thing is about the nature of being a cathedral architect and there's always pressure on you to do something for short term reasons. And what I learned was that one had to make sure that you had a, some idea about the eventual um, prospects for any bit of the cathedral before you felt confident that you were doing something which wouldn't need to be undone in a few years time, which um, has indeed happened in many places. And so um, that was particularly true at St. Albans Abbey, actually. Um, um, you know, there were things afoot which I had to stop, which um, uh, uh, I've never told anyone that before, so keep quiet about it. Um, <clears throat> um, so, well, what is Southwark Cathedral? Well, Southwark Cathedral was previously the parish church of St. Mary Overy. Uh, since the dissolution, and prior to that, it was a priory of St. Mary Overy. And it sat by the bridgehead, um, 
of London Bridge, which of course at that stage until the 18th century was the only bridge across the river in London. So it was the place where anyone going from the coaching inns along Borough High Street would have the Tabard, the Chaucer pilgrims, they would have worshipped in the Priory before they, um, they set off or seek a blessing. And um, so this is Holler's view of London in the 17th century. Um, and it was taken based on sketches um, made on the tower of the Priory Church. So this is uh, us on the tower and the present day view, including St Paul's here and the city of London. And it's just shocking to see how much it's changed since then. Um, and then uh, the 17th century view with Old London Bridge um, and uh, Borough High Street. And the fascinating uh, thing, which is that for some reason, Hollers River turns left when it gets um, uh, here. And that's then perpetuated in various other panoramas at London. That's a, a, a wonderful um, uh, bit of uh, um, Chinese whispers. Um, so, Inside the church, the main thing was the, um, the reordering of the uh, crossing. And previously, there were two steps and then a lower level platform and then another two steps into the, um, into the choir. And um, by putting four wide steps here and on both sides, then this is now level of the choir and it means that the platform is accessible and it's also more, more, more visible. And it was done in, in a, a trial manner in timber. Um, so it could be um, um, reversible, but in practice it's been there for um, 15 years, 20 years. Um, <clears throat> so, Going back to the the history, um, here is a view of um, <clears throat> the um, well. Here's the church, and here's the priory around the cloister to the uh, riverside and cathedral, and here's the gateway into the uh, priory precinct. <clears throat> and then you get older uh, London Bridge with the um, the heads of the traitors, uh, the drawbridge, uh, I think it's called Holbein House. Um, but it gives one a sense of what it was like in the Priory days. Um, we're fortunate to have a wonderful book recording the cathedral with measured drawings from the uh, mid 19th century by a chap called Dolman from which this picture uh, comes. So in 1830, <clears throat> here's the, uh, the church, uh, here's the site of the uh, cloister, and this leg of the uh, monastic buildings, priory buildings, was still excellent at that date. Um, so that became really important later on, but I can uh, tell yeah. you about um, just to note at the moment that that building is in line with the transept. This is 1947. Um, amazingly, the warehouses uh, were not uh, bombed in the war. Uh, this is Hibernia Wharf. And you can see how this totally shut the cathedral in from the south. Um, well, the parish church from the south. It was cut off from the, the sorry, in the north. It was cut off from the south by the railway, and it was cut off by the new London Bridge, which um, uh, was built. The old London Bridge was on that li alignment, and the new London Bridge, Rennie's London Bridge, chopped off the Lady Chapel of the cathedral. Um, so, in a sense, the uh, the whole point of the uh, Millennium Project was to rediscover the cathedral. Um, the chapter house built by my um, predecessor was built on top of a, um, an underground car park. And um, 
we tried within our plans the new building for some time to accommodate the swans but it's proved to be impossible not least because the only entrance is here which is up five steps and it um doesn't lead to uh directly to the theater at all uh, anyway and so when we came up with our plans um I, for the only time in my life, was uh, photographed in the Times under a splendid headline, which says, eight million pound lottery demolition plan splits cathedral. Um, so there's me looking at our, our, our model, where you can see we've got the new wing running at right angle of the cathedral, like the monastic wing, and then the entrance on the axis of the transept, and then because it's in top of the car park, <clears throat> we couldn't put another building here. So this was a line of trees. Um, and this is the, the bit of the chapter house by Ron Sims that we, 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 we kept. Um, the, the campaign was launched by rather scandalously by the previous theme. And um, um, I was, asked to go along and to explain to him why it was necessary to take down the other bit of the chapter house, the office wing of the chapter house. And um, so I had an interesting uh, afternoon um, you know, talking about it to him, with him, and uh, hearing his point of view and um, um, explaining, as it were, why there wasn't really anything else we could do. Especially with both hands. He said, at the end, um, well, thank you for your courtesy in coming to see me. You're the first person who, uh, who, who's actually <laughs> tried to uh, uh, address my concerns. So I thought, well, I've done my bit there. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so the way it, the way it works is that um, these are the that's the, the the edge of the cathedral. Uh, this river is uh, out here. So um, these are the vestries which were built by um, uh, Aldred Scott, I think it was. And this is the new entrance to the cathedral, um, which is done by extending the uh, end of the, the vestries. Uh, then on the line of the historic alleyway, which is, um, shown in all of the uh, the old maps uh, there was an alleyway here and um, we made that as the main circulation between the new and the old and it's very uh, good that we did because it turned out that the only place <laughs> the archaeology was really remaining was going to be in that line because of the basements of hibernia wharf which were on that line and further north so that's why we were able to reveal the archaeology that we discovered uh, at this end of the, um, the, the link building um, to which itself has got three layers of medieval chapter house, um, a Roman road and a, an extraordinary Delftware kiln. Um, <clears throat> and so as for the new, new building, this is the retained chapter house. Uh, by Ron Sims, and then this is the two wings um, as a knuckle around a new staircase that uh, sticks out as a prow, and then the new entrance on the axis of the transept, which is from there to there, and then you can go that way into the refectory, that way into the offices, uh, this way up into the uh, cathedral, or that way into the uh, the vestry. Um, and then at first floor level, uh, we have the great uh, room here, the uh, library. It started off the library with Wren like book cells um, pushing into the space. Um, but it then became a, a, a um, their main uh, meeting and hall like space really <clears throat> but it still has book book cases uh, and bookshelves on both sides 
Uh, then there is the lift and so on. And then there's a meeting room and a corridor, which is open to the double height space here over the entrance, which I'll come back to, uh, to another meeting room and an escape stair. And then this turret here actually includes a stair which leads you up to maintain the roofs. Uh, so it's quite important. Um, this is a version of a drawing for the um, elevation of the new wing with the stair sticking out here. And in this case, there's a gable over the entrance, rather like the gable over the transept. But um, in perspective, as you move closer, that was going to obscure the, uh, the window. And so what was done, in fact, was to um, have a break in the roof here so that you're seeing more directly through to the transept window. And then you have the two great doors, but with a glazed light, which has got some, I think, rather splendid um, artwork by, um, um, oh gosh, um, uh, uh, come back to me, but um, based on um, maps of uh, Southern Cathedral in its adjacent area through history. And the, but the arch is the same arch as that we've got here, which is just made higher. So it's lower here, higher here. Um, this is the model that we had made. Um, in fact, it was made at the stage that there was a possible project for cutting the river back. So you had a very gentle step directly into the river on the axis of the cathedral. Um, it was commissioned by Southwark Council, um, but unfortunately, um, someone decided that it was, they didn't like the idea of them being able to get muddy, and therefore that put paid to that thing. But anyway, the um, uh, the principle is uh, there with the uh, the gap through the buildings opening the cathedral to the river, and. This is the view looking back again from the cathedral side, so you can see the break in the um, the, the the roof, um, the uh, the flint, which is characteristic of the cathedral, the two different sorts of flint in two different sorts of um, masonry. Um, from the mid 19th century and from the late 19th century. So here's a Norfolk style um, uh, checkerboard and then a Tudor style contemporary um, oak, oak screen here and here. So the new, the new wing with uh, these really uh, fantastic nap flint panels, we managed to find some excellent nappers from Norfolk who uh, filled in these panels. Uh, and then the doors, which can be fully opened in summer, uh, which fold right back and just fit neatly within the reveals. Um, and then this was turret was put in by Ron Sims. And this one is the one that we put in, giving the circular stair access to the roofs and floodlighting and cleaning of the cathedral. And inside the link, um, then the same articulation as, as an external surface, the, um, the overhead glazing. Um, and there is a language going on in the whole building of twinned members. Um, so here's a twin buttress, which aren't actually buttresses. And here we have trim back-to-back -back, um, angles supporting the roof. And here we have trimmed twin um, steel uprights supporting the fixings for the glass. Here's the, um, the view through the roof up to the tower. And in the library, the twin precast concrete uh, ribs, which uh, spring from floor level 
uh, and that's a conscious homage to uh, the wonderful church by E.S. Pryor, St. Andrew's Roker, which I show you here. Um, this was actually masonry around concrete, and our one is precast concrete. But um, um, this is uh, one of my favorite churches. Um, <clears throat> and then the oak, oak joinery with um, uh, subliminal classical detailing within the subliminally Gothic ribs. Um, and uh, just to uh, try and explain how it structurally works, that the things that look like buttresses are not buttresses because they have to be, <clears throat> uh, you have to get insulation in. So it, actually they're brick piers with a cavity which is insulated and then the stonework around the outside. So the brick piers are carrying the twin precast concrete planks and the twin precast concrete <coughs> uh, ribs on the roof. And here is the, um, uh, you know, the gubbins in the basement. And this is the refectory, the twin beams with precast uh, vault sections spanning between them. And then the tile arch done in situ uh, kind of subliminal reference to the Roman road layer of the site. Um, and then the bronze and oak for the framing of the doors and windows. The archaeological pit that I described um, was previously uh, banged up against this wall. Um, so in taking that wall down and then doing the excavation, then this is now revealed, uh, and this is the rather wonderful kiln. By virtue of unzipping uh, the existing chapter house from the cathedral, uh, it meant there was a bit of elevation here that had to be made good, and uh, so this is a bit of uh, us uh, emulating Ron Sims. Um, <clears throat> stylistically, it's very varied for that reason. Uh, and then this is a new archway <clears throat> with a new link through from the link to the cathedral with half of which is steps and half which is a, a platform lift. And from the other side here, the uh, platform lift. Um, and this is my, my son and me try, trying it out. And the that my son is relevant to the story because when it came to the balustrade of the staircase, I wanted to do what I had done at Lambeth Palace, which is here are the old twin metal uprights uh, with the, uh, this in case it's a glass floor. And you can see here that the, they're continuous past the upright and they, they cantilever out at the end. And if you look at this, glass panel here, you can see the glass panel is cantilevering out over the end and fixing it directly through the middle. And I wanted to have the metal ones, which are fantastically thin. Uh, they're about one inch by a quarter of an inch. And they work structurally because that quarter of an inch diameter bar, which ties them all together, means that if someone steps in it, it's resisted by all of them and not just one. So um, it's worked. I mean, it's never been bent. Um, but in a public building, you can't have something which can be climbed by a child. So we did, made a test and my son, of course, managed to climb straight over it. <laughs> so we had to go to glass instead, which is a pity. Uh, and then under the ground, um, this is in the link between the uh, basement of the new building and the, um, uh, the basement of what's called Montague Chambers, the office building. This is actually the backside of the retaining wall for the cellars of Hibernia Wharf. So this is also a bit of archeology span of the 19th century warehouse. <clears throat> And then further on the archaeology, there's the um, revealed uh, footings of the Lady Chapel, which was demolished when London Bridge was built. And um, 
a re-landscaping of the east as a, a herb garden um, and then within the churchyard um, re-landscaping to have the fast commuter walk through here with the straight wall and lanterns and then to turn what had previously been a, a, a rather nasty um, there it is um, path along the outside into a sinuous walk um, where you have plenty of opportunity to sit back and look up at the cathedral. And sadly, uh, the cathedral has decided they've got to close the churchyard to anyone other than people who visited through the cathedral because it was so heavily used by people eating takeaways from Borough Market that um, it was a victim of its own success, really. Um, and so this is a sinuous path looking the other way, and uh, that uh, had the effect, therefore, of not only creating all the new buildings, but totally uh, transforming the setting of the cathedral uh, on all three sides. Um, well, that's the end of my story, apart from just to do a plug to say that if you happen to want to um, uh, have a buy a copy of my book, which tells you all about these and other projects, um, then you can get it from my uh, website. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Richard, that was uh, brilliant. Can I, can I uh, ask either through Jonathan, can you uh, access Jonathan the, the chat comments and put those to Richard? There are only uh, uh, a couple of questions. One from Richard Butt um, about the, the the clients. Would would Richard like to speak to that question? Uh, sure. Um, I'm just wondering if I should uh, stop sharing first. Yes. Ah, yes. <clears throat> um, the clients. Um, sorry, which clients are you um, referring to, Richard? Um, <clears throat> well, my question was that. A large number of your clients have been corporate churches, cathedrals, schools, charities. Yeah. And I wonder whether that presents you with challenges in securing a unified client voice. I mean, do you have to spend a lot of time navigating between competing views within the client? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I think. Um, the, the clients obviously have, although they're mainly, um, well, nearly almost in exclusively um, uh, public clients, if you like, rather than private private clients in the sense of private households, um, <clears throat> I haven't um, done very much of that. So there is always, uh, it's not necessarily clear that there's one particular person who's driving it and therefore you have to um, uh, work um, work out who, who who that person is and then um, uh, try and set up the team right in in the first place and so um, it has to be said that at uh, Southern Cathedral Colin Slee uh, drove everything and he was um, uh, not, not particularly good, I, I, I would say, about um, consulting internally, but he was remarkably good at consulting. Um, well, I was the first who heard of any bright idea that he had. And then the next person who heard would be the Fabric Advisory Committee. And um, so he was very happy to use them as a sounding board. Um, and it, it, as it were, anyway, so I'm saying that it's very clear that he was client. In, in, in terms of an alpha edge, then obviously um, um, Chris sort of set it going, and then Jill um, and Wendy um, have been the people who 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 really really made it made made it work. Um, but there's certainly been circumstances in other jobs where. Either you're dead worried that the uh, the person who seems to be driving it is doing something which you don't think that they ought to do, partly not, is, 
I mean, it's not me saying it, it's saying what I think the result would, I mean, it is me saying it, but it's basically saying that English heritage wouldn't possibly go along with that, or the local authority wouldn't possibly go near it. It's finding, it's finding the, uh, the allies who can help move the things in the direction that you want. And um, uh, there was, there was an example at um, um, St Albans where there was a danger of having a, a stained glass window presented to uh, the cathedral in a way that uh, I thought was not going to produce a work which would stand the test of time. And so um, in, the, in that case, um, I was hoping the Fabric Advisory Committee would uh, say something, and they didn't. So, so I then had to say, well, I think there's something of this importance. We needed to have a, a you know, some sort of um, appointment process or a competitive process. And anyway, we did that, and it came up with a, a, a you know, an answer which I think was <laughs> the right answer. So it's very much about. Um, uh, politics uh, occasionally, and also about tact and about um, you know how to um, how to use other parties to try and put forward so it doesn't appear to be you being the arrogant architect. Uh, Richard, there's a question from Mary Bright, which is quite short, which is in relation to Southwark Cathedral. Do we know whether the kiln? was used by the occupants of the Abbey? Um, no, the kiln is um, post, post dissolution. Um, so it was during the period that it was a parish church and not, not a monastic. So even if you might have had monks uh, doing pottery, which I suppose is possible, um, I think this was clearly uh, outside the wall of the, uh, the then uh, church and um, uh, it would have been a, a, um, one of those, you know, pottery outfits for which Lambeth was once noted. Yeah. C can I ask one question, Richard, uh, and then I may have to wind things up, but uh, as a heritage architect, did you decide at an early stage that that was the area that you wanted to specialise in? Is it now a kind of established sub-branch of the profession, or, or is it something that you just get into because your interest is more in restoration than it is in designing new build? Uh, well, that's a very good question, because um, I, I actually came to architecture rather late in the day because I went up to college to read engineering and wasn't happy doing that. And then, um, as it were, found uh, architecture and I found architecture through being interested in old buildings. So the old building side of the architecture was always um, an enthusiasm, but there is a danger, I think, at the moment that as it becomes more and more professionalized into what's called conservation architect with accreditation from the various accreditation uh, organizations, that it's seen as being a technical discipline and not an artistic discipline. And um, I hope it's come through from my talk that the aesthetic side of things is, is, is an incredibly important factor yeah. and you're balancing all of these different, different, different things. And so I really uh, learned at the feet of uh, Julian Harrop, who was the architect who's best known for working with Chipperfield at the Noyes Museum in Berlin uh, and at the Sir John Soane's Museum, but he uh, specialised in working with old buildings, but his background was uh, making models with Jim Sterling. So, you know, not a, not a normal background. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, now, is there one, one final question that anybody would like to articulate by uh, unmuting themselves and putting it to Richard? I think uh, we've had a very good session, and uh, if there's not somebody queuing up, then I'll, I'll wind things up. But Jonathan, you can perhaps see better than I can. Have you got anybody who would like to ask a final question? Not that I can, not that I can could, see, Tim. Could, I, could oh. I Could I ask a final question, which picks up on something that Richard has just said? Um, the, the aesthetic element of it, and throughout your talk about St. Alphages and Southwark Cathedral, you've referred glancingly to the sort of range of references that you've drawn on. 
um, those seem to be particularly rich. I was struck by all the sort of references, particularly in Southwark Cathedral and the new build. Could you talk to us a little bit about that and, and how you do that and what your approach to that was perhaps in Southwark particularly? Well, um, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> um, I, 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 I was studying architecture in Cambridge at a time when the modern movement, you could say, was still um, the, um, the normal position. Um, and in as much as I um, went into architecture, through an interest in old buildings, either through looking at houses with my parents on holiday or looking, going to the Nicholas Pefner's Slade lectures about architecture, uh, or indeed looking at the new buildings in Cambridge at the time, which I found very interesting. Um, I, um, I, I realized that um, uh, the breadth of my interest in architecture inevitably had repercussions in the way you thought about something. I mean, when I started, it's quite worrying. You think, oh God, I'm an engineer. I, 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 I you know, I'm not, I'm not one of these arty, 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 arty types. And so in the face of someone saying that, um, uh, you know, you, start from first principles all the time. Well, I wasn't. I was sort of saying, well, you know, that's a, a fantastic way of doing it. Or like the ribs that, um, uh, as I say, about uh, Roka. But I mean, if you came to my barn in Suffolk, I could go on and then there's sort of five different uh, <laughs> references there that I'd love to <laughs> elucidate. But um, yes, I, I, I consciously think of that. But not in order to be esoteric or sued, but because I think they fit. Yeah. <clears throat> well, Richard, uh, can, can I, on behalf of the society and all those who attended this evening, thank you for your talk. Uh, and uh, I'm absolutely sure that I speak for everybody in saying that it was one of the most interesting and illuminating talks I think the Greenwich Society have ever organized. I think what is wonderful is to have somebody who's such an enthusiast for what he's done and can share that enthusiasm with laymen who don't understand some of the technical details, but can understand the overall impression for which you were uh, aspiring. And I can't think of any career really, which could be more worthwhile than creating something which hopefully will last for hundreds of years for the delight of worshippers, for visitors, it's uh, an extraordinary achievement and sharing it with us is something for which we are very, very grateful indeed. Thank you very much. If there was a round of applause, I'm sure there'd be a standing ovation, but on a Zoom basis, could I just thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. <clears throat> I hope everybody will do what I do tomorrow, and that is buy the book. So Greenwich Society, buy the Griffiths book, on which happy note we'll take our leave. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.